Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Esther Martinez, and we're back with another session in People Matters Virtual Learning Series. Today, as you all know, is an extremely relevant topic, and I'm very, very excited to welcome you all to have a conversation on the future of people's strategy post-COVID-19. Uh, I think all of us uh, as business all over the world, we're battling with the impact that this global pandemic is having in our uh, business model, in our people's strategy, and there is an immediate need, I think, that all of you are working very, very hard to support your employees, to support your business at the same time. Uh, and, and in today's discussion, what we really wanted to do is to zoom out a little bit and take a look at the bigger picture and how this new normal in the future will be defined and also what will be the role that each one of us in the HR talent community have uh, to help our organizations to be ready. Before we start, I want to thank uh, everyone who's joined us. And I think this is uh, an opportunity for us to reflect and share a message of immense gratitude to everyone in the HR community like yourselves who are at the forefront of the situation, supporting not only your uh, people managers, your employees, supporting the implementation of a lot of immediate measures that, that your business has to take and really balancing the challenges uh, that the pressure of disruption is having in your business, but at the same time, balancing that with the human side of the crisis. So before I start and I introduce you to our panelists, a very warm message of encouragement to all of you who are contributing every day in making it happen for your businesses and for your teams. So today's panel, we have the privilege to have with us uh, one of the most brave and courageous lateral thinkers in the talent world. Uh, that's Chin Yin Ong, a head of people and IT for Grab, talking to us from Singapore. Welcome, Chin Yin. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, joining as well, we have a consultant, a, a teacher, and one of the most active and warm influencers in the community of talent, Jason Avogok, CEO and co-founder of LeadGen, talking to us from uh, the U.S. Welcome, Jason. Hi, Esther. Good morning, good afternoon to everyone, and uh, thank you so much for having me. Most welcome, most welcome, Jason. And uh, joining us as well, a business leader with the true people at the center approach. Uh, Nikhil Arora, Managing Director and Vice President of GoDaddy, uh, joining us from India. Welcome, Nikhil. Hi, everybody, and uh, thank you for having me on the panel. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. So thanks so much, uh, Chin Yin, uh, Jason, Nikhil. We have a packed agenda today to cover. We will be, as, as I said, in the context, we will be zooming out a little bit today. And uh, for all of you who are looking at content, which is more immediate and here and now, as you know, People Matters is covering COVID-19 from all angles uh, across all our channels. And we also have a special issue this month, which is going to be out this week, complimentary for everyone in our community. So feel free to reach out to us for more additional content. In today's 15 minutes that we have together, uh, I think as a team, we decided to zoom out. And that zooming out was really by design because we believe that sometimes you need to zoom out and take a look at the bigger picture. So then you can zoom in again and take the right decisions who are going to be aligning to that larger picture and the larger objective that you have decided uh, as an organization. So with everyone's permission today, we will be focusing on that future uh, picture and also inviting our co-panelists to not only help us design and think through and visualize the future, but also to help us um, think through what will be our role as we go along. So before we start, um, uh, Chin Yin and Jason and, and Nikhil, I'm going to just request the team to uh, share the screen for a couple of questions that we've prepared for the audience, as we always do. So you will need to go to Menti. Uh, if you can just show the screen for everyone. So you'll have to go to Menti. Yes, there it is. So menti.com. Uh, and when you go to menti.com, there'll be a code that you'll have to enter. So the code will be 375020. We prepare a couple of questions for you. The first question you will see on your screen is to help us reflect about what is your opinion on what best will describe the new normal after COVID-19 stabilizes. We don't know how long will that be, whether we're talking about three months, six months longer. We don't, we don't have a time frame. But in your own mind, when you're visualizing post-COVID-19, how will you define the new normal? So there, there are five uh, options for you, and I, I push you to try to avoid option B because that will be a little bit the easier one. So option A is uh, I feel that how work gets delivered will significantly be different. So that's one answer. 
The second is uh, the way organizations look at talent and culture will significantly be different. C is the way that we look at leaders and what we expect from leaders will significantly be different. Uh, D, for those who are not able to decide among A, B, C, you truly believe that actually all three will be significantly different. And uh, the last option is for some of you who think that, yes, this is all fine, but finally we'll all come back to the old ways. So if you could just take a couple of minutes as we get everyone to respond and we start seeing the answers. And I love to hear uh, Nikhil, Jason and Chin Yin's opinion as it, as it comes in the answer as well. All right, so let's see what's coming out. All right, so I was tempted with the team yesterday night whether we should remove uh, option uh, all of the above because that's actually probably really true uh, and, and the numbers are showing, but it's interesting to see um, the first one in terms of the way we work being the second one. Yeah, any comments, uh, Nikhil, Jason, Chinjin, as we see the data coming up? So Esther, yeah, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Jason. No, I was gonna say, so Esther, the, you know, th this doesn't surprise me at all, and it really doesn't surprise me that the D is leading the way. I think that if you look yeah. at, if you look at A, A basically encompasses almost B and C, so yeah. I mean, when you take a look at this, we're really, you know, if you just do a little bit of a quick math, you're looking at 140 out of 150, you know, yeah. let's just make it round numbers, um, you know, are yeah. now 150 out of 160 that are yeah. saying that everything will be different, which yeah. is, uh, yeah. you know, which is a, it, it, I, I personally agree with that. And I think what's yeah. most important to understand is it's our job to think about what is going to be different and how we prioritize, which I know we'll get to, but it's good that this, it, this is very validating. Very nice. Thank you. So, Nikhil, you wanted to add something as well? No, I think Jason covered it. I think, uh, you know, in the, in, the, in the first one, I think the leadership one, in my mind, carries a lot more weightage because yeah. uh, it starts with people. And if people are not able to do that transformation, you know, the first bar will fall through. All right. Okay. Should we move to the next question? Chin, anything to add? Did Chin, anything to add on, on this? Or we move to the next? Yeah. All right. So the next question is a little more personal question. And uh, we wanted to ask this question to uh, our panelists. But before that, we wanted to ask you as well. How are you feeling today uh, in the context of uh, traffic lights? If you were to look at the traffic lights and say uh, red, yellow, and green, what would that be? So red is about feeling stressed, overwhelmed, uh, struggling today. Yell orange would be, well, things aren't perfect, but, you know, I'm kind of managing. And green would be, well, whatever it is, but I'm still feeling positive today. So very quickly, if we can just have a moodometer of today, so that will help also Nikhil, Jason, and Chin Yin to address the emotions in the group, uh, at least virtually. And I'm going to ask this question to you as well, uh, Nikhil and, and Chin Yin and, and Jason. All right. So we seem to have an orange and green group today. So Chin Yin, I'm going to ask, I'm going to start with you. How are you feeling today? And if you can expand your color with one line as well for us. Right. Um, so uh, hi, everyone. Um, well, based on my brand guideline, I almost have to choose green um, because Grab is represented by, by you know, our logo, which is, which is green. But, but to be honest, I, I think what I've um, tried to share with a lot of our leaders and also the people in my team is the attitude will overcome actually many, many things, right? Uh, I have this funny saying, I said, you know, just make sure we look at the donut and not the not the whole, uh, and we, we we ask ourselves to always look at the bright side, and also then that helps us find what are the opportunities or things that we can still continue to do to make things better for everybody else, right? 
So, so I think that part um, is where I am, uh, and I just in the morning went out and buy and bought um, two more plants for my home. So again, uh, just find things to do that makes you happy, and I think that's kept me in the green zone uh, ever since this uh, whole pandemic started. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, Indian, for sharing that. Uh, Nikhil, you want to follow? Yeah, so I, I, I'm yellow, and uh, I think uh, yellow being uh, I can control the controllables with it, which is how I react, how I manage, you know, myself, family, employees, and my team. Uh, and, uh, and you know, the, the kind of anxiousness is more outside as to, you know, what, what will turn out in terms of the, the problem ahead for, you know, in terms of the, the epidemic itself. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, Nikki. Jason? You know, and, and Esther, I, um, I, I fall in the green category myself, but I think one of the things that's really important to understand, and I've been saying this for about the last 10 days now, is I truly believe that we as a profession are right now at the intersection of confusion and opportunity. Uh, confusion and opportunity. And because of that, it's not surprising at all to see the orange and the green both right yeah. there. The confusion is right is the orange, the opportunity is the green, and we really don't know exactly which way we're going to go. Um, the other thing that I just want to throw out before I turn it back over to you is for those that are feeling in the red, um, <laughs> uh, I encourage you to reach out to me on LinkedIn, and I'm happy to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with you because uh, red's not good right now. Um, I, I understand the natural kind of feeling around it, but there's there's a lot of things that we can be doing as a community together to to really think about not in that crisis mode, but to really think us up, think of us at that intersection of opportunity and confusion. Wonderful, thank you, thanks, Jason, and and thanks everyone for being uh, so truthful. And I think the first step of moving out of red is just acknowledge that I'm in red. So so kudos to all of you who self move yourself out of red just by uh, being aware of where you are right now. So we're going to jump in into this uh, opportunity site. And uh, Jason, you set the context beautifully on, on, on we are at the intersect between opportunity and uh, confusion. And I think the objective we have as a panel today is uh, bring a little bit of clarity in that confusion so we can help everyone who's watching this panel really move into action into those opportunities. So let's start with defining and visualizing this new normal, uh, whatever we call this new normal, which is very confusing right now in everyone's mind. And I'm gonna start with you, Jason, on, on the three aspects. We're gonna break this down into three aspects. One is how work gets done. Uh, Jason, you will cover that. Then we will move into, you know, what will be the kind of environment in terms of culture and in terms of alignment that we need to, create for our employees to be able to uh, fulfill their potential in that new normal. And I'll request Chin Yin to cover that. And then I'll go to you, Nikhil, on what would that mean in terms of the way that leaders engage? And when we discuss leaders, we actually look at leaders across levels. So Jason, help us understand what this new normal gonna look like in terms of the way that work gets done. Yeah, thanks, Esther. And I don't know, you know, whether it's the new normal. I've been using next normal. You know, the, we we don't know exactly what that is. And I think it's really important to think, you know, to think through. I think the most important thing that I'd I'd encourage everyone that has the opportunity to join this is that it it the next normal needs to be intentional. Um, we have an amazing opportunity not just to let it happen to us but to really make it intentional. And there's a couple things that I wanna talk about and I'm gonna use the, the, the start of the word transformation or trans to really think about this. And if you think about, if you break down the word transformation, the trans component is move, move. So when we think about move, we're going to both move the concept of physical work. The concept of physical work will change. Um, now, does that mean no one's gonna to go to the office? No. Does that mean everyone's gonna work at home? No, but we're opening a lot of eyes right now in the, in the communities when all of a sudden executives and organizations are saying, my people are working fine from home. Like we're really surprised how well they're doing. You know, we're really surprised there's no issues. And you know, it's funny to me kind of because I've been saying it for a while that outside of work is more advanced than inside of work. 
And all of a sudden we're realizing that, hey, it's 2020 outside of work. Guess what? It's actually 2020 inside of work also. Maybe we should let people operate this way. So I think there's going to be the, the movement from a physical standpoint that will just balance itself. I don't think we'll get rid of one or the other. I think it will balance itself. But then there's also the movement of work. And I think that's more important as we look at the concept of digital movement. And we're realizing now that we don't need paper. I know that sounds goofy. Uh, we're realizing we don't need nine levels of approval. We realize we need to be more agile. We need. We realize that we need to be more succinct. And you know, when we talk about digital, the first component of it, and Esther, you've heard me talk about this. It's when I speak at your events. Is mindset. And the mindset has to be digital first. So I think what we're going to do is I think we're going to move how work gets done. I think we're going to move the physical and virtual components and blend those together. And then we're going to move a mindset. We're going to move a mindset that says we're not going back. We're not going back. So it's 2020 right here. And all of a sudden I hit this brick wall, you know, and guess what? We're all now in 2020. So let's not go back. Let's not go back and say, let's put in place all of our processes that we've had for the last 15 years that no one knows why they're doing them. But let's make sure that we use this as our reset or our fresh start as leaders to say, guys, this is the new, what I call the now of work. Let's not start talking about the future of work. This is now the now of work. And I think that's our amazing opportunity as leaders. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, Jason, uh, for bringing awareness of the word trans and how that applies in the three elements that you mo uh, mentioned. So I'm going to quickly move to Chin Yin on what does it mean? How will you define this new normal in terms of uh, the definition of a new culture? And how will people align to this new normal or this now of work? <sighs> if, I, if I may just add um, a couple of yeah, points to, to how work is, is viewed and done differently uh, on the earlier question. Um, really? I've, I've been thinking through um, a couple of things. So one piece of data that I've just read was that actually software sales has been going down. And, and the question is, the, the, the facts were very uh, unintuitive to me because the, the way that um, digi digitalization seems to be pushed ahead uh, you know, it is, it's countered by the question, uh, with, by the fact that software sales are down. And perhaps I think that's uh, a little idea that the way sales is done um, for, for digital goods may, ha may, may actually have to be very, very different. For, for software companies, uh, enterprise software companies, they probably need to sell it very differently ra rather than the usual go down to the clients, do POCs, and then, you know, you, 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 you can adopt the, the technology after that, after you've purchased it. I think there's a very big change. Even software developers and, and those people need to think about how they sell the software right now. A, a slightly more, um, I would say, philosophical changes that I think might happen, and this probably will take time, is that we will start questioning whether a non-growth way of looking at productivity and work uh, is, is relevant uh, at this point in time. Non-growth means that, um, that there is less uh, pr pressure. Non-growth could be everybody start working the utopian work week, which is whether it's four-day work week for, for many people or maybe even three days, right? Would that become maybe even possible because of what we're facing um, right now. It, it encourages two things, right? Maybe it encourages more people to be able to return back to, um, to the work because you spread the load across more people while, when people work less hours. I think that's one very altruistic thing that they can do. Uh, and the second thing is that people get to live their lives uh, hopefully in more productive and eco-friendly ways, uh, but less stress and stuff like that. So, I mean, I'm just, again, philosophically trying to think whether this might push us to a very different kind of uh, productivity and economic point of view. The last point I'd like to make about the work part is, is around um, what is, how are jobs compensated? What are defined as 
useful, truly useful jobs and truly impactful jobs versus others, right? As you can tell in these desperate times, it is not the soccer players, it is not the uh, movie stars that are, that are really uh, helping humanity. Uh, I'm sure many of them are doing their best in many ways by contributing, by donating uh, a lot of money, a lot of uh, resources, right? But the people whose work are truly valued right now, maybe people that are very different from what we used to uh, prize them at, right? So for example, um, in Singapore, we just had one day a week of home-based learning. I think it's in the US, it's, it's probably different. And you have tons of parents coming in to say, could we just not pay our teachers a million dollars a year? I'm happy to. <laughs> you see? So how, and, and how, how jobs are priced right now might change drastically after this on how jobs will be priced. So, so that's my, again, just um, greenfield thinking about how work could, might change and how jobs might price. On, on culture, I'll, I'll try to make it fast, the culture and alignment. I think what we have, I, I, just, I actually feel that there are very few things that are more important than culture in the organization right now. And in a way, that's probably not going to change in the future as well. I remember um, in the market brief that the BlackRock CEO um, shared with the market, and he basically said that a lot of companies are not focusing on culture, but we are because we believe that great companies which will grow, come out of this um, situation well are those people who actually will focus on And I think the root of culture, there are two that companies need to focus on. Focus on purpose and focus on trust. Purpose is something that keeps people doing what they do, even if it means that they have to take a 10, 20, 30% pay cut. Because if they believe that what they're doing is right for the world, they will continue doing it, right? The second thing around that is, is trust. Uh, whether how you share information, how transparent you are, and that actually impacts how fast decisions can be made within the company. Yeah. So the more trust you have amongst people, the faster decisions, that means that you can pivot much better. I think the last focus of any company around, around being able to do well in the future for, from a culture and alignment perspective is, is really, really embracing that change happens very, very quickly. Yeah. I, I still have... Um, people telling me that, oh, um, you know, it's been really hard because um, the pivots, you know what we've been doing the last few months, uh, they're sort of gone to waste uh, and I don't feel good about it. And and sometimes I I, I, I surprise myself with the patience I have, but, but I sometimes want to just tell these people, guys, this is the new future. Pivoting every other day should be something that you embrace and you enjoy because yeah. you, you should feel that you will be very bored otherwise. And this yeah. constant pivot is something that I think companies need to get people to be very used to. So, Chindin, I'm going to follow up very quickly after uh, Nikhil's uh, uh, comments on leadership because we're going to start moving into what does that mean to each one of us as talent professionals in the next section. Uh, so I think great point on the productivity will be defined differently. Jobs uh, and how we value jobs will be defined very differently. The importance of trust and purpose and the embracing that constant change. So we'll move you quickly then after that on what does it mean to each one of us as professionals. Before I do that, uh, Nikhil, just quickly take us through what is this new normal when it comes to leadership expectations? And it kind of builds up into what Chinjin spoke about of, of culture uh, and alignment of purpose and trust. But what's your point of view about what will, how will what we expect from leaders change in this new normal? Uh, thank you, Esther. Thank you, uh, Chin and uh, Jason. Uh, so, just a quick statement on you know on on like a macro level, and then I get into the leadership. Right? I think clearly there will be digital disruption. Uh, there will be acceleration of you know how work is done. I think the thing to watch out, which is an opportunity and risk, is how different it'll happen in different markets. Right? Because I just want to give you an example. Right? The concept of social distancing is a great concept in today's time. But when you bring it to a market like, for example, India, it's a balance between starvation and social distancing, right? Uh, and so 
as we look apply that to business right there will be a lot of dependencies where one model will not fit all uh, many phases of this disruption digital disruption will emerge and different you know kind of uh, things will need to be put in place uh, you know by different stakeholders so i think it won't be as fast as people in my view you know are expecting it uh, but it may be it happen but you know it will have a lot of different kind of lives to it in different parts of the world uh, from a leadership point of view uh, i think uh, you know firstly you know i always talk about uh, uh, you know you have to be missionary first and mercenary next which essentially means uh, that every leader will have to become a purpose driven leader and in many organization it is true but the mission statement for example today how integrated it is with the employees right i mean every organization perhaps has a very strong mission in the world most of them have uh, but how does it actually connect to the employees right when i'm evaluated every year is anything connected on that mission in my evaluation many times it's not right meaning like for example if you talk about you know transforming lives of people do you know doing whether it's a financial product or digital product or whatever it may be uh, you don't get evaluated right so i think as leaders we will have to take that mission and actually connect to the employees and have them very closely aligned uh, and 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 have them actually accountable for that because many of every employee wants to be accountable today it's not part of that system so it doesn't happen right um secondly i think uh the employee softer side right the mental wellness physical wellness psychological wellness now it's a concept which has been talked about a lot uh, it's always there in the checklist um of every company uh, but how serious and how professionally is it executed right uh, this time has actually really brought that to light that you know what sustaining people is you know how mentally uh, well you can hold yourself physically well you can hold yourself psychologically well you can hold yourself so as leaders i think we would have to make that really much more prominent much more executable and really really up in the forefront right uh, secondly i think as leaders uh, connecting with the community i think the hyper local model will emerge out of that which is both digital and physical because what's happening out there right in my community how can i go out and help and connect with people now the shadow of digital has been that we are so di digitally connected but physically disconnected that sometimes i don't know the 20 small business shops which are located a kilometer from my home now they're in trouble they're shut down or they can probably help right so mobilizing those efforts right so wherever organization is situated the headquarters their offices how do you bring that hyper local model and add your employees connected with that right uh, and then i think lastly the communication element of the leader will will have to be very very i won't say different but perhaps a lot more faster speed velocity many you know modes and mediums because uh, what is sustaining right now is consistent communication good communication you know reinforcing uh, people the positiveness right so the whole communication model from the leadership uh, will probably have a relook wonderful wonderful thank you thanks nikhil and i'm going to stay with you for the follow up question uh, on we've got a little bit of a picture now uh, they briefly and i know time is short but i think all of you put together have touched upon this visual helping us visualize what this new normal will look like in terms of um uh, and some of those elements as as jason you were saying they're actually now and not tomorrow they were reality even before but i think it's just more obvious how we need to transform towards those as we go forward so what does it mean to us everyone who is here in this uh, session today what does it mean to hr what are the things that you know we have to really adapt and change and we'll take couple of a time horizon so what is it the one thing nikhil that you will suggest the uh, hr function to do in the next 3 to 6 months to adapt to this new now and one thing that you think we should look at which may have a little bit of a longer horizon of over 6 months one thing that we should immediately do in the next Three to six months. One thing that we should be starting to think of doing that will probably have a, a longer horizon. Uh, Nikhil, if we can start with yourself. Yeah. So in the short term, I think it's it's going to be pretty obvious as this this crisis behind us. Uh, there will be a lot of anxious employees, uh, anxious about uh, jobs, anxious about their mental well-being, anxious about you know everything and anything, right? So I think that that to me is the number one focus where the HR can really. you know come in and figure out uh, for each organization you know how can they reduce their anxiousness what they can provide uh, both from a 
personal point of view and a professional point of view because you know what what's happened is the boundaries between personal lives and professional lives are very thin right now like in the western world it was always uh, you know kind of hands off distance uh, in kind of the asian part it's probably less that because you know they're all integrated but i think now that model of asian uh, probably will i think get exported to the western world because that boundary is going to be very thin, right? So short term, yeah. uh, what HR can do to kind of reduce the anxiousness, build positivity and confidence. Yeah. I think in, in the long term, I think uh, beyond six months, I think this is an opportunity for the whole HR function to rethink why it exists, right? Because other than benefits, other than hiring, other than kind of doing, you know, what the normal thing is, um, what is the, I would say the skilling part, right? Because to me right now, uh, and, and, I, and I'll give you an example, right? Like when you're in an office, you're used to working. I need to walk over to my employee to you know, get hold of him. I'll just walk over because I know he or she is not working. Now in this kind of digital world where if you're working remote, uh, how does that happen, right? I mean, how do I, I, mean, how, how do I know the person's available, not available? Am I interrupting? I'm not interrupting in colleagues. Am I being kind of more intrusive and so on, right? So the whole kind of, I think Chin mentioned about the productivity, how is productivity going to get measured? You know, how, how are employees going to held accountable and also training employees to be self-reliant because many of us are used to getting out to the office and working uh, and that's our way of model. Now, if I'm shifting to my home, maybe I'm not equipped to be self-disciplined or self-reliance. It's not a bad thing. It's just that I wasn't, you know, equipped to be that. So how HR, you know, starts looking at that model in the future would be, would be very helpful. Okay. Thank you. Who would like to sh uh, follow? Chinyin, you want to follow on short term? What will it mean for each one of us in long term as well? Sure. Um, I, I think it's short term for me. I, I find HR people sometimes have a lot to learn from, from our marketing folks, right? I feel that our comms um, tend not to hit the spot in terms of timeliness, in terms of relevance, and in terms of tone. Uh, yeah. We tend to be more used to just deploying policies and just tell people, okay, this is this is this follow this and then you're gonna do. So how do you build trust um, through your comms? How do you encourage people to build trust with each other? I think it is very interesting. Uh, I think this is also in a way um, a new a, a new season for us to think about creative ways of conversations uh, and and two way conversations as well. So when it comes to platforms, think about the communication platforms that HR owns and HR runs. Uh, we use um, Workplace by Facebook, for example, and it is a great uh, way to engage um, two ways because people ask a lot of questions and leave a lot of comments with a post or when we do a video call. Um, the next thing we did was uh, something called Grab Radio um, because we said, you know, we want to bring cheer and news at the same time yeah. and we wanted it two ways so that people can make song dedications. So we actually have Grab Radio to all employees twice a week uh, and we actually have um, the ability to host these radio in our grabbers' homes and, and they are able to do that, right? So I think I think that's one thing that HR needs to strengthen in the next, um, yep. actually starting from now uh, is it how we do communications and, and look at the how Gen Y does it. Film more TikTok videos. Um, find a way to do that better. Longer term, I, I feel that I really like Nikhil's uh, point around um, hyperlocal. Uh, I, I, I feel that a lot of decision making norms that we need to, we are used to nowadays, needs to be changed, right? So that, well, when lip service was paid to empowering people on the ground, I think this is the chance we really need to say, how do we literally group frameworks where decision, and, and actually maybe you have to define these set of decisions, you don't even have to come up to yeah. me. But then how does the central um, body feel that they have a sense of control? So I think defining a new way of making decisions is going to be very important because we do need to empower people to move faster on the ground. Um, the, the last thing, as I said, I think we will have to look at uh, compensation models a little bit. How do we define what is work that is valued uh, in, in, in the organization, right? Uh, I think um, that's going to be uh, an interesting study that I hope more of us can participate and do it together. Wonderful. Thanks. Thank you, Nin. Jason, you're uh, actionable for us in this call today, uh, short term and long term. Yeah, thanks, Esther. So the short term is uh, people need to be asking the question right now, does it matter right now? Um, we're going to be forced to do less with less. 
And because of that, I need to ask that question. Does it matter right now? And then the, the last addition I need to add to that is to the workforce. Does it matter right now to the workforce? Because we all have to realize that this is a massive shock and there's aftershocks for all of our entire workforce going on. And they need to be front and center for us. So this isn't the time to make HR more efficient. This isn't the time to do stuff for HR. It's the time to do stuff for our leaders. So we have to ask that question, does it matter now, right now, for the workforce? And then the second thing we need to be doing on a little bit longer term basis is our pledge to change this means that we design the people function of the future for the employees and the managers and the workforce and not for us in HR. Okay, so we have to intentionally design differently. We've designed HR up until this point for the most part for us, for HR, which is okay. And I'm not just talking about technology, but we have to bring front and center and Nikhil and Chin Yin both mentioned this concept of hyper-local. Like that's all tied to personalization. Like Chin Yin can offer hyper-local content and knowledge beautifully through Workplace by Facebook. But if you don't have a platform like that, you can't do that. You, we as people can't scale people alone to a hyper-local model. We're just not going to get the headcount and we're not going to get the, we don't have the tribal knowledge to always have it in our head, both to push out knowledge, but also to create connection. And connection is what everyone wants right now and what everyone is going to need for the foreseeable future. So uh, those are the two things, Esther, I would say is asking that does it matter right now to the workforce and then yeah. thinking about anything we design, making sure that it is designed at the workforce at the center. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So I'm going to uh, take some questions right now with, uh, and I, I, I'm taking questions a bit earlier because some of the questions that are coming are very uh, timely on, on things that you, uh, each one of you have uh, touched upon. So, Chin Yin, the first question, I'm going to address it to you. Uh, I think you mentioned about measuring productivity being a very different uh, approach. And, and really, organizations will need to think through how we measure productivity differently. And there's a question from uh, Nagendra Prasad about, okay, what does that mean? How do you actually measure productivity, especially when uh, probably we'll have to balance these working from office and working from home and different levels of balancing we have to do? What, what is your point of view on how will productivity be measured? So the typical productivity measures that HR teams probably um, um, go by these days are perhaps uh, revenue per, per headcount, right? Um, I, I think that's almost a, a typical measure that, that most of us are going by now. Um, but I think my, my, my question, I think, will be to say that would, would it be is there a possibility to to have a lower productivity target i.e do we have to keep growing right if the word productivity always has this trend that goes we just need to do more with less more with less and every year the company is asked to do more with less right and and i think it starts with the expectations of the market um and, yeah. and um all shareholders and your stakeholders I don't think it is something, productivity is something that an individual company uh, can change uh, unless if they're privately held, I think that would be easier so that if they once they manage to say, look, we don't expect uh, a year on year growth of X amount. Um, and then the people need to expect, it also means that my income may not go uh, increase by this amount year on year. Then how else can we actually uh, look at the well-being of the people by saying, okay, if that's not going to happen, that also that perhaps means that we can introduce a four-day work week because that also saves costs in a way, but yeah. we can actually do the same amount, hopefully, and be able to make sure that from a PL perspective, we can still survive. Yeah. I mean, those are radical things that I think very few companies are ready to do uh, because humans, as we are, look for progress and there must be improvements all the time. But as I said, there are there are philosophers and economists from, you know, even the 12th century talking about a utopian world where the whole humankind is not pressed on progress so much, 
uh, yep. and lead better, better lives. Wonderful. Thanks. Thanks, Chinjin, for sharing that. Anybody wants to add on, uh, Jason, Nikhil, on, on that question about how will productivity be measured and uh, really redefining even the foundation of how businesses have operated uh, going forward. Otherwise, I'll move to our next question. Hey, so Esther, I just want to add one thing really, really quickly, if you don't mind. Go ahead. Yeah, what, the question of measuring productivity is a, it's a loaded question, and I hate to even, I, I was try, I'm trying to decide whether I should say <laughs> something or not. You know, what, what I want to do is I want to create a culture to drive the best productivity possible. Okay. Now, productivity, how I measure productivity is not necessary. It's not an HR thing. It's a business thing. But my job as a people function is to make sure that I'm listening to my employees more than once a year. I'm creating, creating an experience for them where they have the tools, the capabilities to get the stuff done that they need to get done in order to be as productive as possible. And I need to make sure that from a talent planning standpoint, I'm not looking at jobs by old fashioned job code, I'm looking at skills and looking at tasks. Okay, so I need to change how I think a little bit in HR about what it's required to get the most output, A, but then B, with the with the workforce I choose to go with based on a true plan, I need to make that workforce, workforce A, has the information and tools they need to do their job, but B, yeah. I'm measuring them on a real-time basis and acting on a real-time basis to make sure that if something gets off, we do a quick adjustment, just like we do in our supply chains. Uh, this is why once a year engagement surveys are so broken, excuse my French, um, when it comes to like, it just doesn't work to be able to do things and, and act in an agile way that we need to. Uh, take a follow-up question uh, because I think we spoke about productivity in the long term and how that from philosophical point of view we need to think out uh, but there's a question specifically about productivity and performance evaluation from Raja Pandayan saying okay this is fine but short term how are we going to manage performance evaluation as of right now and, and I know many companies have actually put uh, performance evaluations on hold uh, but how long we can have it on hold and uh, what's your approach short term when it comes to performance evaluation? How do you navigate through that decision making at this moment? Anybody wants to give it a try? Sure. I mean, I'll, I'll give it a try. So I, I ahead, think uh, I, it's a question is re related to the short term, I assume, Esther, right? Yes, They're talking about right. here. Yeah. So I, I think, um, you know, to me, the from evaluation right now is going to be on on leadership attributes, right? Uh, because everybody is now a leader in this crisis. Uh, no matter what level you are, uh, you know you are ultimately impacting one other person, whether it's a colleague, whether it's a customer, whether it's a supplier, whether it's you know a, kind of a, another functional person sitting in in another part of the world, right? So uh, the traditional performance management, I don't think uh, it, it matters now in the short because business conditions are different. You can't, you know, you the, the KPIs you set for the employees perhaps of all would have changed or not been achieved because of uncontrollables. But what's, Correct. you know, what, would, what one would be measured would be how, you know, as an employee, you are kind of not waiting for things to come to you, but what are you doing to, you know, take things back to, to your team members, to your customers, to your suppliers and all that stuff, right? That's one controllable everybody has. And so that's one metric, you know, we are looking at to say, uh, you know, how do we do that? Secondly, I think the motivational quotient, right? All of us are now responsible for motivating our next uh, colleague uh, because we may run out of steam. The other person may run out of steam. So we all have to kind of lift each other. So, uh, you know, for example, like whether you're doing wellness uh, things with them, whether they do meditative things, with, these are never on the performance evaluation, but now they matter, right? What is the motivational quotient you're bringing yeah. uh, to the yeah. table to everybody around you? Nice. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, uh, anything to add, Chinit? Yes, go oh, ahead. Uh, uh, just, just a quick one. I, I think many companies are, are re -goaling. So, So when it comes to the rewards part tied to evaluation, I think a lot of people are, are thinking of other options because I think nobody is hitting their results well. Not many people are hitting their results uh, at this point in time, right? But to, to, to uh, Nikhil's point around, so what do we look at when we look at uh, evaluating people, not so much the evaluation, but the feedback that's 
needs to be co even more constant at this point in time. Because even as you pivot, you could pivot wrongly. You could, you know, have still be, you know, pivoting the wrong direction. And, and so we, what we have opened up is to, to have a tool that actually gives everybody the chance to have anytime feedback uh, with each other. I think uh, a lot of companies uh, might uh, have a feedback forum, whether it's six, once in six months, once in once a year. But I think it's really, really, uh, really too too late by then. So immediate, uh, constant, and constructive feedback, I think, is what's going to help all of us uh, get better, right? With uh, even in a time like this. Wonderful. Thanks. Thanks, Jin Jin. And hey, Esther, just one thing. Just, Esther, just yeah, really quickly. I mean, I mean, really quick, and I'm going to leave this hanging. So I realize that, I don't want to take the time. Just use this opportunity to get rid of them once and for all and never bring them back. Like, mm -hmm. it's truly like, I, don't yeah. just pause them, reinvent them. It, mm -hmm. Our employees want us to pay attention to them. Our employees yeah. want us to not necessarily give them feedback, but to give them coaching. They want it yeah. more than once a year. You know, it's not in most organizations tied to pay anymore. So like, just use this time to get rid of them. I mean, if we're looking for something good to come out of this, it would be because if you ask most managers and employees, they don't like them. They don't like doing them. They don't see the value in doing them. And they feel it's an HR thing. And I think that back to what I said earlier about designing for people, if we design the now of work for employees and managers, we don't do performance management the way we've done it in the past. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Jason. So last, I'm taking one more question from the audience and I'm going to come back to some of the uh, questions that we had prepared team. So from uh, the audience, we have uh, Nandani's question. Uh, her concern is out of sight could be out of mind. So how can we create, how, how can organizations build affinity in these times? And I think not only short term, but also long term. And changing you, you mentioned that in terms of culture, alignment and purpose. Some creative examples or creative ways, uh, if you could be specific, it will be very uh, relevant for the audience. How can we help uh, people managers build more affinity in this moment and also kind of extend it that long term as well? I, I yeah, could been to give some um, specific ideas, right? On social connections, um, what we have um, done, I think what we do know is that people are probably still getting together on video calls with people that they know pretty well. Uh, but I think that that gel is missing when people can't really meet somebody from another team and the understanding and the conversation actually will never happen just because you probably not randomly go ask another person and say, you know, hey, hi, uh, do you want to have a Zoom call? You sort of miss all those water cooler, bump into each other kind of situation, right, when you're physically together. So one of the very specific things, again, you know, a lot of these digital tools have the ability to help us. Workplace, and I, 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 really, I really don't work but I, I, we're just using whatever we have we have found uh, helpful. Uh, we have we actually created a bot, uh, and his name is Carl. Uh, and we said coffee with Carl, right? So people can join, uh, and we've encouraged people to join a group uh, within workplace. And the bot basically matches each other, right? And to be able to uh, and and people have conversations um, with others in within Grab that they have never spoken to before. We actually piloted this when there was a sense of true surveys that we did with our Chinese uh, base grabbers. There was a sense of isolation because firstly, um, they were the first one to be locked down. Secondly, uh, there, there is also, you know, a few hundred of them, not, not a very, very big group. Uh, and they were quite far away from South East Asia, where all uh, the markets are. So, so what we did was we actually piloted this program with matching Chinese base grabbers with grabbers outside of China and to have a conversation to just talk about their day-to-day the -day lives, not necessarily about work. And then people leave comments about how they felt after that conversation. And it was really, really heartwarming to see the kind of positive effects about just saying that, 
hey, I heard, you know, new recipes. I learned new recipes from this person because, you know, the person has been uh, experimenting because there was nothing else to do, right? So I think these kind of things are things that we do. Taking on Jason's point about coaching and mentoring, people are still looking for coaches and mentoring and mentors within the organization. And this is about the best time to actually start those matching yeah. and then that connection of people. Again, um, some seniors, juniors, whether we are looking at a DNI angle from a, a gender perspective or from a tech versus non-tech perspective, virtual bridges can be found and can be built. And, and I think this is where we can do a lot in, in whether, you know, find a way in the algorithmic way that you can match a mentor and mentee. And then that makes it much faster rather than having a HR person at the background and figuring out whether this person should talk to the person and stuff like that. So I think that's, again, innovative ways that we can, again, reflect back and give back to people what they really need at this point in time. Wonderful. Thanks, Jin. Thanks, thanks Jin. Jason, uh, Nikhil, anything to add? And then I'll move to the last question. No? Okay, good. So, hey, um, we, uh, really, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, just ahead, really, ahead, really ahead, quickly, sorry about that. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that I, I think people need to realize that that just because people aren't standing next to someone doesn't mean we don't have connection to them. I think it's a really important thing. I mean, we talk about all the time high touch digital and high touch human. You know, and there we can be high touch digital, and we actually can create better connection digitally for certain things than we can with high touch human. So I, I'd ask you guys just to think about that when you think about that concept of affinity, like if I'm pushing out culture messages, if I'm pushing out value messages every day to my people, you know, I can do that better digitally than I can with a person doing that. So just just keep that in mind. It, 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 it's, it's how do people and machines work together to create a better world? It's not one or the other, it's both. And blending those is going to be our huge, our big opportunity going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. And we have lots of questions. And unfortunately, uh, just five last minutes. And, and I will probably request the People Matters team to share those questions uh, with all of you. And if we could take some time to answer them, at least offline, that would be great. But I want to have the last five minutes to do a round robin on probably your final words of advice to all of us who are in these uh, virtual learning, uh, reflection, and uh, visualization call today, in terms of one of, the, one of the things that you will invite us to start doing, and one of the things that you will invite us to stop doing, um, to really finish in that note of actionables, and I think there is a lot we have covered, but any closing words, uh, and Nikhil, I'm going to start with you on one thing that you'll invite the HR community, the talent community in this call to start doing, and one thing to stop doing. What would that be? You know, it's a very basic thing, Esther, but like stop treating yeah. this as a phase. Um, I don't think this is a this is a temporary phase because human tendency uh, is very short term. Like it happens and then, you know, suddenly eight months from now, uh, you tend to like totally forget the magnitude of what it was. So I think as professionals, I think we have to we have to assume this is permanent. Um, uh, and, and how the degrees of change happen is, is, is a different question. Uh, in in terms of like start doing, I, I think, uh, you know, going back to what I said, right, human first, which means uh, that the, the, the boundaries between employees, family and employers work is going to be a lot more thinner. So how do we, you know, take those policies to make sure, again, it's mel wellness, mental well-being, but also connection with the families, right? And I just give you an example, Chin was mentioning coffee cooler. I mean, it's okay to have your kid hang out on Zoom calls now. It's okay to not look that perfect on your Zoom calls or, or, or whatever, you know, type of call. It's totally fine. And I think we we have to enforce that because a lot of people still feel like, oh my God, I got to dress up and I got to look, you know. So I think more of the approach from an HR down the road of like, okay, how do we, how do we get into the employees ecosystem? Uh, and for that matter, customers ecosystem much more closely, you know, the hyper local model. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, Nikhil. Can you, you want to follow? One thing to start, one thing to stop as we close today. Yeah, I, I think uh, I think what we need to start doing really is to is to define uh, and use this chance to define what is the normal that we're going back to, right? So I think many people know that um, is it going to be a new normal? Um, don't I, I know there's a lot on everybody's plate 
at this point in time. The governments are changing their stance every day. We are writing communications every day. Um, but do you know cover a little bit of time to plan for what what you want people to come back to? Um, because if not, the time will just pass, and then eight months later, you'll be like, oh, 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 I didn't. I sort of didn't have the chance to think about it, that kind of thing. Uh, I think what you need to stop worrying is is putting in plans um, to and worry about the ten percent of, of of the of the workforce. What I always find uh, us doing is a lot of the policies that people write or HR people write is to make sure that we cater to the ten percent of delinquents, and we need to write such a tight policy uh, so that so that we can catch those ten percent if they ever you know, uh, uh, not falling, right? I think we need to really write policies in a much more human, trusting and respectful manner, but, and it caters to the 90%. And if the 10% comes, it turns out to be delinquent, I think um, we should just, you know, get, get rid of them and they're just not right for the organization. Yeah, yeah, wonderful thing. Thank you, Chin Yin. And the last three minutes, Jason, for your, uh, final advice on start and stop. So, you know, to me, I mean, a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful conversation. Uh, you know, to me, every, we as professionals in our short lives with only a few breaths only get one, maybe two opportunities to truly change the way the world works. Like we're always fighting for it, but we really only get one or two big, big moments. And, and, and good or bad, this is that. Um, because it's global, it's all at the same time, and we're all coming back to a fresh start. Now, what that looks like is up to us. So when we think about one thing that we should do is we should make the pledge when we, when we think about this, as we think about bouncing back, that we don't go back to the HR function that people desired to not talk to. We go back to the people and that people desire to work with because they're driving the business forward. They're driving competitive edge and they're making people the most productive they can be. The way to do that, if I could just break it down in one quick second, is with data. We haven't used data as a function. And I'm not talking about analytics. I don't start saying cost per hire, time to fill. I'm talking about using data to truly make sure that I can create experiences for people that make, that get the best out of them, that focus on their strengths and drive their best work forward. So making that pledge and thinking about how do I use data to make myself the most important function in the business because people are our biggest spend, I'm not the police, okay? I'm the organization that helps me become the most productive and the most competitive edge function I can. And the one thing to stop is exactly what I just said to start. Stop being <laughs> that organization that people don't want to talk to. Stop saying the only reason we're still doing that is because Chin Yin said we had to do it that way. Like, it, <laughs> it, that, Chin Yin, she, her thoughts are old. They don't matter anymore. They mattered in a world that's different than today. Okay, we have to change and transform how we work. Okay, and this is the once or twice in our lifetime opportunity to make it happen. So let's make that pledge together. Thank you, Jason. And I, I can't believe that we spent a full hour. Uh, we started with the uh, uh, kind of realization that it's a time of confusion and at the same time, a time of opportunity. And I think through the conversation we've managed to uh, declutter a little bit that confusion into some kind of picture, uh, which really I think it's a gift that the three of you have given to everyone uh, on this call. And I think the closing remarks that each one of you have given us just now, it's really that empowering message that, uh, that there is confusion, but there is a big opportunity. So I want to thank you, uh, Nikhil, Jason, Chin Yin. I think it's been a fantastic conversation from the bottom of all our hearts. Thank you so much for giving us your time. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Great. So we will uh, take this to closure. And uh, I think it's been fascinating. A lot of questions, unfortunately, we couldn't cover. But I'll request uh, Somia and Gundi to, to, to kind of find answers and, and come back to all of you. 
and uh, we are going to be seeing you very soon uh, i think our next uh, learning session is going to be on 16th of april uh, which is going to be at 4 pm singapore time 1 pm india time uh, on a roadmap to people analytics and jason share that a little bit uh, as a closing remark and we'll have sola osino osinoki senior director at uh, naspert uh, global people technology and he'll be joining us then so thank you so much once again everyone who joined us for this conversation it was fantastic and i look forward welcome you guys very soon uh, once again thank you